Welcome to What's My Thesis. I'm your host, Javier Proenza. Every week, my guests and I share the answers we found to the questions we have. Join us as we explore and expand our worldview through research and ask, what's my thesis? And I am suspicious that you even have your name on Instagram, correct? Because you just have <laughs> Kale, so I don't even know how to introduce you. What's your name? Uh, my name, I actually do go by Kale, but uh, I also go by Kaylee, which is my name. Kaylee. <laughs> yeah. Kaylee, and in your last name? So we have like... Yeah, I'm um, Kale Serrato Doyen. Doyen. Doyen to do this interview with you. No, I'm kidding. Sorry. <laughs> do you get yeah, that shit a lot? Or is that like, am I super clever? Uh, no, people don't really, I mean, it's, it's really weird. I think it's just a weird last name. Cause I'm at, I'm half Polish and half Mexican and I hear yeah, that yeah, yeah. like a really weird combination, but, um, yeah. That's definitely <laughs> what I picked up on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so you you just mentioned we like before we started recording that you're from Michigan. Uh, I always like to get an, a, a context for the person that I'm talking to before we get into the topic. But I feel like we're gonna get right into it pretty quick because uh, I don't feel like there's gonna be a lot of small talk between us. Not that we like are like I think we just kind of look at each other's stories and we have a sense of like each other's rage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you're in Michigan, right? Yeah. What part so of Michigan? I'm from, I'm from like Saginaw, Michigan, um, which is two hours north of Detroit and like an hour north of Flint, Michigan. So I'm very embedded in the Rust Belt and like rural experience of America and all that jazz. <laughs> okay. I'm actually going to hit you up for references then because I'm kind of curious about Michigan because Michigan's a really interesting place where like a lot of, especially in California, a lot of, um, I met a lot of progressive white dudes. And I, like, you know, just to clarify, I don't even consider myself white passing. <laughs> I'm just mad at people when they don't acknowledge my whiteness. <laughs> you know, because it's like, for me, it's like, come on, bro. You know, like, but I do get, I get Jewish and I get Middle Eastern. So I don't, I, there has been a very, like, uh, big scare tactic historically with those groups. So I can see how people would tend to like put me in there. But um, yeah, white guys from Michigan, I, I, they're, interest, they're an interesting group because I think that, I don't know, I, is it Trump country over there? Yeah, it's very much. Um, cause yeah, I, and it's funny though too, to like introduce myself like this. Cause I do feel like a lot of my work, it just kind of like speaks for everything. Cause yeah, we're going to look at like, Trump country pictures and all kinds yeah. of stuff. <laughs> well, but, but here's, here's my point about those guys. And, and it's not like to, to bash them, but I think that it does come from a little bit like more, you know, like I'm a white guy who's like, who's got a, a, a disruption in the family line because of communism and because of America's policy towards communism. Like I come from a country that picked the wrong side to like, you know, like Russia wasn't the winner right? <laughs> In the Cold War. So, so, so I think that like my perspective, and I could also be very right wing because I like, in, in fairness, my, uh, like Miami is a very right wing place to some degree. Uh, I, th I think that the Democrats, they're very right wing, right? Like it's like, but I think that um, what I, my, in my experience of white guys from Michigan is that they are very progressive but they're also very like confident talking about things that they shouldn't probably like they're not necessarily qualified to talk about and they do white explain a lot. And I think that that comes from the fact that they're more in light they, like they're like the, the attitude that when we talk politics is that they're like, no, dude, you don't know. You don't know what it's like, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, no, I kind of do. <laughs> I think it's um, it's. That, but also partially about um, how segregated things are here. Because I'm also picturing, like, what are progressive progressive white guys in California that are from Michigan? Like, what is that kind of guy look like? Um, mm -hmm. Because you could have University of Michigan graduates or just any of the, like, Big Ten or whatever. Like, that's a whole different type of person than the people you're going to yeah. meet. Like, and, yeah, specifically people of color from these, like, lower Well, if it, if it helps, Ann Arbor. So that's like a college town, right? Yeah. I'm like so embarrassed to be wiping myself down with napkins, <laughs> but I ain't got no shame, dude. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. 
Um, yeah, I, yeah, Ann Arbor is like a call, huge, huge college town, biggest college town we have other than like Lansing, but I would, it's arguably a bigger college town. Um, yeah. yeah, like you just, it's just a different type of person that goes there, I feel like, and the institutions itself that are here that people can go, people go to, but then think that they have a complete understanding of things. Like, it just reminds me of like, kind of like 90s diversity and the quality, like stuff like yeah. that. It's very like base level. You know what I thought was always going to happen when I was a younger person? I don't know I, I, what the age gap is between us. I, I'm guessing you're a millennial, but I'm, I'm, I'm uh, last gener- last year for being a uh, 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 Generation X. And man, the way that like I always thought that every decade women were going to be like, I'm a this decade woman because that shit was so big. Like. <laughs> it, it's it was an interesting expression of feminism because it was like it was feminist but it was like yeah but i'm also not like a feminazi like it was just a weird uh weird mm-hmm. thing you saw it on on a lot of sitcoms you know like it was the i'm a 90s woman i don't i, I wonder if it, like have you heard that as a millennial is that like in your radar or on no, your radar i'm actually the first year of gen z so i'm like mm. super young. And I, I think like that's, uh, yeah, it's something I'm excited to talk about on this podcast because um, I am super young still. I have a lot. Of- <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. So, okay, so let's get to your topic and then we'll start from there. Yeah, so for my topic, I picked, um, I just kind of, I'm doing like a broad thing, I guess. That, I that works. To talk about, I want to talk about landscape and I want to talk about the Midwest as like a geography and a place. Um Oh yeah, where should I start? Is, um, so is Michigan considered Midwest? I, what's considered Midwest? I don't, Midwest, I don't actually know. Yeah, Midwest is like, and then it's hard to define too because I'm, um, I've been dabbling in graduate school at University of Pittsburgh. So like people consider like parts of Pennsylvania the Midwest too. Mm-hmm. I again, I'm not an expert on everything, but uh, my definition of Midwest is just like. Michigan, and I, 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 if I'm remembering correctly, just from maps I've seen, just like things that are like around Michigan. So you have Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, probably Minnesota. I don't know. It's just everything I feel like. Is I like always that. thought Minnesota. So <laughs> I, I, is it anywhere that they have flat A's? Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. Cause we, and yeah, I've heard from so many people that I talk a very specific way. So yeah, I've, I haven't, yeah, I haven't heard it. You, you, you haven't hit me with anything that crazy because last week I had someone from Chicago on and, and or she's Irish and from Chicago. And she said, Chicago and then fire. <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> yeah, I was listening to hers. Um, I don't know. I don't say it the same way as that. And I actually spent I did my undergraduate in Chicago. So, OK, I th- yeah, I say Chicago. <laughs> I don't know. I That's because you're an elitist. Good. You're not a working class hero <laughs> from the time. No, I think it probably takes a while to pick that up. But it is, but it's, for me, what was funny about that is that it's like, it's probably a word that in Dublin, she probably wasn't saying very often, right? Mm-hmm. And then now in Chicago, she, 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 like, you pick up the dialect of where you learn a word, right? Which is amazing to me. Yeah. So anyway, so, so landscapes. Landscapes. I, I, I see. I can see why. I, I feel like there must be something to Michigan landscapes because there is a lot of like uh, landscapes uh, work coming out of that area, right? Like I, th- I, I just get that feeling. Maybe even just the whole Midwest. Um, yeah, what do you I, think that is? I so um, actually something interesting I heard from. Um, I don't know how to have this conversation too because we also like. Uh, maybe I should fill you in just so like when mm-hmm. I name or when I drop the names of like places and things that I've like it just is all contextualized. So I'm from Saginaw and I went to school in Chicago and I did work for like a bunch of museums while I was in Chicago as well. Um, and now I'm like deciding between graduate school options. Um, but when I was in Chicago, what was I talking about? Oh, the landscape. Okay, so when I was in Chicago, I met um, Naomi Beckwith, who's now the director of, just recently director of Guggenheim. Um, mm-hmm. She, I mentioned to her what my undergraduate thesis is, which was about the Cuban photographer Luis Medina, who was active in Chicago, and mm-hmm. I wrote about his landscape photography um, for my thesis. But um, 
I mentioned that to her when we like had the opportunity to meet her and she was like, you know, it's like really interesting because everyone in contemporary art is like focused on the body and like you don't hear a lot of people like talking about landscape and that is very true. And I think yeah. I meet a lot more photographers now that are starting to engage with photograph or engage with um landscape work. And I think it's, we will definitely see a lot more landscape work be produced in the last 10 years. Also just considering that like landscape is a very um, or was a very popular genre when you're not. It's different, but, but it's the, like, it's different than though that like, I mean, cause when I think of landscapes, obviously a a Ansel Adams and that kind of like stuff. And I mean, Lee Friedlander also did some and, uh, and like, obviously there are, it's been covered in a more dark place, but I think, I think there's something about it. I think that I'm thinking specifically, there's like a documentary style that it's, it's like, it's not about romanticizing the landscape, right? Which, which would be a, a Adam's kind of approach where it's more of a, um, a thing where you're dealing with like the, well, I mean, there's romance in there, but it's, it's like poignant in, in a sense. Right. And, and it's, it, it deals with this, like, um, uh, I mean, it's essentially a lost dream, but it's also very colorful and very like, it's beautiful at the same time, but like mm -hmm. in a, uh, uh you, you know, like a, a tra tragic way. Right. Instead yeah. of like being like, and, and when you mentioned bodies, I definitely was like, I'm trying to think like, I, I don't know a lot of landscape photographers that shoot LA itself which is interesting because I, I i think that that's like a very well treaded on <laughs> you know like uh place because it's in every friggin movie it's it, it almost becomes like too iconic right like if you take a picture of randy's donuts or uh or, or anything like that or, or like or like it it just becomes like um it references pop culture in this way where it, like when you're dealing with landscape photography in a place that isn't that well uh, documented, there's like there there's a lot. It feels like a, a richer, more exciting tapestry. Whereas like you know, the challenge here is maybe like romanticizing uh, LA because LA is just a bummer <laughs> in, in a very in visual ways. But yeah, I I I do find that interesting. I and um, what you're what you're alluding to is what like one of my first like points is because um what you get out of a landscape will depend on who is doing the depicting of the landscape. So um, when I was in my undergrad, I took a graduate seminar about, it was titled um, Cartographies of the Empire. And it was about, we learned like how to critically analyze Latin American colonial um, period photography, or not photography, Latin American colonial period landscape paintings. Mm -hmm. um, but through that, we were doing a lot of like we I, that was how I like learned like what is landscape theory, um, which landscape theory is. I don't I don't know actually who started it, but I, I just know of it like what I've been taught. So I know mm -hmm. that um, we learned a lot from like W J T Mitchell, who in the '90s made his book Landscape and Power, which in it, it's kind of just like his treatise on like how we should think about landscape and how to engage with landscape when. Um, there's a power differential and politics that are contributing to what makes up our own, what, what, what makes up the land around us. Um, so if you think about landscape as a verb or like a medium instead of whatever we think about it now. So thinking about it in that way, as if it's like a canvas or something, like landscape is just land, but land is then impacted by like the cultural things that happen to it or the political things that happen to it, et cetera. Um, but land no, is also just, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to interject that it's intrinsically political, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely, yeah. That, and that's the whole, um, that's their whole thesis as well is that um, where we are is all dependent on like, these historical and political things that have happened to this landscape, especially if you're thinking about a late stage capitalist landscape, um, which is actually, that's kind of what, what, you, you know, you just hit on what I'm describing when I think of, cause it is, it's the hollowing out. Well, it's, you know what? It, and, and it's almost interesting because 
I hadn't thought about this until we started having this conversation, but it's it's interesting to think about late stage capitalism. But you know, like I'm not I'm no I'm definitely no defender of capitalism because it uh you know, it's always been horrible to people, <laughs> right? But the it's almost like it's late stage because it's ruthless. It's not just like arbitrarily like it it, it didn't like if the greed, I mean, okay, now I'm convincing myself. The greed is what makes it late stage. <laughs> I was like, if they did, if they weren't so greedy, it could have still functioned. But now I'm like, no. I mean, I think that like perpetuates greed. There's like uh, studies that have shown that like you have no empathy when you get super fucking rich, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, it also um, it being late stage is there's the implication of um, time as well and how time. Time impacts landscapes and land in the way, or in in a way, you know. So um, when I'm talking about like late stage capitalism, I'm talking about this very specific um, landscape that I have to deal with because of the consequences of letting capitalism go on for this way in this long of a time. So, yeah. um, but when we think about the implications of time as well, that's where um, going back to like colonial period paintings, the people that were, and, and it's interesting because when you, I remember at least, um, and being from rural Michigan, like there's like no art museums here, <laughs> like maybe like three times in my entire like public school education, we like got to go on a really big field trip to the Detroit Institute of Arts. But um, that's also, you're thinking about like the 2000s, 2010s, um, still very much like seeing these giant landscape paintings, like just the the beautiful sublime ones in um, museums, all of those are or were painted at the time to convey a certain agenda as well, a political agenda even mm-hmm. as well. Um, and Cezanne, I, I that? argue that it's a political agenda, even when they're not like even portraying the sublime experience in a certain way when you're talking about land is political. And another tactic they would do if you're thinking about these landscapes as an agenda um, would also minimize the experiences of the indigenous people that were already on the land. So you have like um, one example I'm thinking of, I can't remember the name of the painting, but there's like a Thomas Cole painting where um, it's just like this giant landscape and there's like mountains and the sunset and it's beautiful and whatever. And then there's just like a tiny part of the cliff where like you can see these little tiny like Native Americans. And like, Mm -hmm. but that's the point of it too. They're trying to convey to you that this land is a certain way and that our actions are okay because, oh, there weren't that many of them there anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Okay. So that's the read. Yeah. Well, w- and and uh, go, just to like back up your point about the sublime, like, because um, I didn't want to break, break up your flow, but the, uh, like Cezanne, the idea of him painting landscapes in this way that was uncertain, right? Like about perception which uh, though those are actually very political ideas at the time. We take those things for granted, but it is, um, you know, we, you, we're dealing with, with a transition from like, we're, like he's dealing with scientific ideas that were, that were uh, sort of evolving rather than like the man, we're, we're leaving the man being the center, well, the white man, <laughs> the European man, being the center of the universe. And we're getting into this sort of thing of like, well, Maybe we're not perceiving this right, and little little things like that are they like obviously his work is sublime, but uh it's it's interesting to think about even like what you're saying that it is political intrinsically uh mm-hmm. when you when you make when it's an interpretation which uh automatically carries baggage related to the time, so it's fascinating, yeah, anyway yeah. and um to talk about like perception too, because the perception then is extremely important because depending on where you are, whether it's in like our social caste systems or whatever, that impacts then your experience of the land and it impacts like what you then convey to other people as land and, and more than just land, obviously, just like that, because that all impacts like um, your behaviors and your habits and your worldview, et cetera. Um, so when we think about perspective, that's where my work is really interesting because um, I'm really interested in like how the United States government is funded or founded on like specifically land-based politics where like originally the only people that were supposed to be able to vote were these like white landowning men or like 
men that had money, you know, essentially. Um, but for me, like I'm, I'm from a family that ex has experienced intergenerational poverty. So like, I really, my friend helped me come up with that for like a scholarship mm -hmm. application or something. I was like, <laughs> you know, like, cause I used to just say generational, but she, she like corrected. Well, people, like, people used to, well, the, the generational, I've never heard that term. I've always heard it referred to as generational wealth. But if there's generational wealth, it makes sense. It follows, yeah. right? That's exactly. really good. Yeah, and I think like that's that's something I've I've started saying to help convey to people like, no, it's not just like that. I'm poor. It's like we've been poor for multiple years, which again is about um the time aspect of like late stage capitalism. Like if you yeah. if you let things get this bad, some people were going to be on the worst end of it for multiple years. Um, but when we're thinking about that, then. I'm from a family that is, and I am experiencing intergenerational poverty, but I still live in this system where everything is dependent on land ownership and possession of capital. My work then is really interesting because I'm making landscapes and like showing you land, but it's all from this very specific perspective because for me, I've always been the antithesis then of like the white landowning men. And I like, I'm just speaking from my own experience as well, because then there's obviously women of color who have it even worse than I do, like black women yeah. and indigenous women. Yeah. But uh, you're not I, like, you're not white. You're Chicana, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, or at least that's my understanding of how you identify, which makes sense. And, and but that's also interesting because um, I had, and that's contextual as well. So that's interesting. I, I mean, I, and I think it's completely valid because uh, like, like I mentioned, you're among Trump supporters, <laughs> you know, uh, I also uh, talked to what's it called? Aubrey Igmar Manson. And she's, she's from, sh or yeah, she's from Chicago. And so like, I find Chicano an interesting identity because even here in LA, like, I all right. I I know a woman. Her name is uh, Aspasia. She's a really good uh, type. Um, like, she's a graphic designer that is like a type scholar. I probably will have her on the show because her understanding of like she works uh, with calligraphy mostly, uh, or she has a calligraphy business. But she her background is in type, and she was telling me a story about how the um like like how she met someone from LA and she was like hey we're chicanos <laughs> and she was like no i'm mexican that's not even my identity and she's white mexican right so um she's not oaxaca oaxacan or anything like that it's like northern like northern mexico I, apparently is a little bit more white i don't i i'm not very well versed in this but then tying that that's like a that's almost like uh, an identity that is like dying out right and then i talk to Ob or at least locally right or, or it's so specific that you can't even be mexican and be chicano and and that's valid i'm not like questioning it i'm just trying to like pin it down but when i talk to aubrey I igmar manson she's from chicago she came over a a or she she's i asked her and she was like well i used to identify as that but now i'm here in la and to her it was like I think it's valid for her to still identify it as that, but she felt like in here, like in LA, like the struggle was so much different that she didn't, she like, you know, that identity changes. Right. And, and she didn't feel comfortable doing that. And I, I, I I'm not like questioning a any of it. I'm just like, like I relate to that deeply. Right. Because like I said, when, uh, I don't know if I said it when, when we started recording, but when I was in Miami, I was a fucking white guy. <laughs> like we, we had more power like, uh, than, than white people, but now I'm over here and I'm learning what it's like to be treated differently. And yeah. I'm like, Whoa. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's geography specific. And I yeah. think like, the reason, the reason I like associate myself with certain, like, identify or like signifiers of identity is because like for people in the midwest especially if you're talking about like a rural geography like your experience of race then is so skewed in ways yeah. that, like like because now that i'm like going through academia i do meet more chicanos and 
Latinx people that are from like California and places like that, where it's like, that's a whole different like ball game for me. And it was in Chicago as well, because Chicago, um, just being a center where more um, immigrant families are there, like people are more closely connected to um, the generation of their family that did immigrate. Um, that's also not my experience because my grandpa's grandparents, my grandpa's parents were the ones that traveled from Mexico to here. But now we're like multiple generations into being. Um, but to Mexican me that, that or to, to me, like I'm a fucking expert. My understanding of Chicano is that it's like not, it's like, it's a race thing, right? Like it's like to some degree, even though you're getting Americanized, you can't assimilate. So I still think for you guys, it's valid, even though like it may seem uh, different here. I, I uh, from that basic understanding of a white guy, <laughs> that that uh, uh, that like that doesn't seem that doesn't um, that doesn't seem off to me. But it's also interesting how like those things like okay. Another example of what I'm talking about, and this, is, this might help me make the point, because I'm not at all trying to define anybody and trying to say what the definition is. I'm just trying to, like, process this, because it's, it, it, you, like, seriously, like, that's, I have a much easier time assimilating than either of you guys, right? And especially, like, even if you're living in fucking Chicago, I don't care, like, that may be a community, but I also speak Spanish, right? So, I forgot the example I was going to bring up. What was, oh, the, uh, I've ridden in Ubers. I don't take Ubers too much anymore because I have a car again. But uh, when I did, it was fascinating to talk to people from Honduras. Now, I'm s not super well-versed in Honduras history. I only know Honduran history based on our history, right? Like, of the last few decades. Like, mm -hmm. Biden, Biden's involvement and the fact that we are essentially... Like, Biden had a coup there with uh, Hillary Clinton, and they started training uh, soldiers there with, like, the, uh, they, they brought Iraqi soldiers from, I think it was, I, this, this is just all from memory, so don't hold it against me, but what I do know, which I did recently look up, so it's fresh in my mind, is that during the Trump years, they started bringing uh, Israeli soldiers over here to train or, or not over here, over to Honduras to train people how to fight counter-migration tactics. Now, if you're bringing Israeli soldiers, you're getting them for their expertise with Palestine, right? So essentially what the plan for Honduras right now is to turn Honduras into an open-air prison because we can't stop ourselves from fucking with them, so we want to keep them caged, Right. <laughs> and I mean, that's not funny. I'm just like laughing at the horrors of like uh, the reality. Right. Yeah. So when I was on this Uber ride with this woman, she was talking about how. And it was a, an expression of her tr attempt to assimilate. And she was saying that she resented. And this is common through all Latin American cultures. She resented the um, the Hondurans that were coming over because they gave people like her a bad name, right? And that is like, that is, is deep. And, and I know that from like, you know, like that happens in my family too. Like my, my grandmother is like super aristocratic, judgmental towards like lesser, you know, chusma <laughs> and uh, people. She's like, she doesn't like the word gozar. Like the, uh, you know, which it's like to enjoy yourself, but she thinks that gosad is gauche. And then her, oh, I said this on the show, but it's one of my favorite things. She, her insult to you is like, you, eres tan ordinario, which is, you're so ordinary. <laughs> but then it's interesting because you don't speak Spanish, but you also like, that was another colony, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've had, um, like a lot of time in undergrad, like just spent thinking about this. And I do still have um, family members too that are also like, like say weird things about border issues. And it's still part of these larger issues of assimilating into a white supremacist culture. Um, yeah. Them having to, for generations now, like become like fit in these weird boxes and whatever. Because um, my family, so my, um, 
I want to get this out there too, because I have a really interesting relationship with music as well. Um, mm. My grandpa and grandma met because their brothers were both in the band Question Mark and the Mysterians, which was like the first Mexican American band with a number one billboard hit. Um, also, Stevie Wonder is from Saginaw, Michigan. So okay. like both of those being from specifically Saginaw, like you are like, and also um, something I've thought a lot about the, the Rust Belt and like specifically like cities where like capitalism at least was there at one point. Um, mm. You have a lot of people that migrated, whether they're black or Latinx, migrated specifically for work so we have these like very um kind of postmodern, i guess like or not i don't even know if it's postmodern. like just things like after 1940 1940 these cities where um you have like it's kind of like a cultural hub because like that's where especially in michigan at least where like factories were to um make car parts and stuff were all there and so people are like as well, part of the diaspora coming to these centers where um, there's work because you, because it was good work and you didn't need to be highly educated and so now we have this really crazy thing where like education well and and even at the time education wasn't even that expensive like I mean my parents what they went to school for was fucking nothing right mm -hmm. like so but yeah that's that is really interesting how that how, how that de develops and now like. And now there's nothing, so there's desperation there. Yeah. In some, in some cases, I don't want to like overstate the case. I don't. I'm not that well versed in Michigan politics, but Flint don't seem too good. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's what um I want to do like add to it as well because it's still these places and the like. I was also alluding to like why my family can be racist sometimes or whatever. Like why you have these little instances of assimilating to a white supremacist culture, like these places were still um, subject to redlining and they're still subject to the entire history of legal segregation. And even after like segregation being like illegal and redlining being illegal, like you still have like the consequences of all of that stuff happening. So um, Michigan is still very segregated. Like the cities here are segregated and like you, and that was why being in Chicago was really um, enlightening for me because everyone knows that Chicago is segregated, but like yeah. experiencing that helped me realize like, Oh, like uh, where I live is segregated and all yeah, of these yeah, places. Yeah. And part of it going back to land-based politics is also um, what that means then for the agency of people of color that are subject to being in rural landscapes and how it spreads us out more um, even like spatially, like I am just like landlocked essentially from like, and was landlocked um, growing up just from meeting other people of color. I, um, one of my really close friends is um, Iraqi and he, we lived in the same hometown, but we didn't become friends until college really, because like we went to just these different schools. Like, how are we in the same town? Like we still don't even end up in the same places. So, and then um, that also to say like, Michigan still voted blue last in in 2020 and obviously the um the election results are the are the result of like people of color like showing up for this past election um but then the county that I voted in voted red so my vote didn't even count and like if people of color were able to shift the vote like that but you still were able to silence people of color in these rural places that I'm assuming would have voted blue. I'm not saying every person of color votes blue, but um, like it, it's just never going to work. And that's the result of like this history of legal segregation. And like, that's also the point of like legal segregation was like spreading us out more and yeah. also gerrymandering because a lot of um, in Michigan, and I know this is true of like the entire country, but just like where districts were drawn was also around the sixties when you still have like legal segregation and redlining. Yeah. Well, I will tell you straight up that I am from Florida, so I can totally relate to that experience. And now that I'm in uh, California, it's just like Florida. It really is. Like, it, especially on a local level, like why does California not have uh, Medicare for all? They could. We mm -hmm. could totally have it here. 
uh, and it, 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 it is a, you know, the notion that, um, that it's like progressive over here is a complete fallacy. Mm-hmm. You see it from people like Gavin Newsom, whatever. All they do is play this identity game. And it's the... Um, where do I want to go with this? Because I, I don't want to go off on a tangent. The, uh, like, for me, the, you know, in terms in, of, of uh, being a Cuban, just reinforcing that sense of, like... I, well, okay. Cubans have almost like have the best immigration rights of anybody in this country my parents when they moved here they had to be here 15 years and then they got the you you know they were naturalized citizens it wasn't a fucking hassle and for a lot of people that was the case so for them to become so conservative and not want people to come into the country it definitely shows a lack of empathy it's a class thing, right? Yeah. It's sort of why, uh, I don't know if you've been up to date on uh, what, um, what's going on with the Biden administration, but everything gets essentially rebranded because the good guys are in charge and now kids are not in cages. Kids are, you know, or... In the holding facility. <laughs> yeah, and, and, it's, and, and the whole time that Trump was in office, no one talked about how it was Obama. <laughs> who did that shit like it was obama and him and and no and when we talk about like there's such the, there's this really powerful thing where uh, i don't know where where the advantage of uh of overcomplicating things of of having the idleness to like you you, you kind of have to have the wealth to sort of get well versed in all these histories right like Regarding, um, like, you know, going to fucking law school, <laughs> right? Like, it, that's not accessible to a lot of people. And even if it is, they're living in debt. It's, it's insane. So I think that, um, I don't know. It's, it's a, it, basically, the, sis, the, the system of white supremacy hasn't really changed in the sense that Mm-hmm. You're dealing with um, that 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 need to assimilate and that need to be part of the system and be not an outsider and be of it is a huge pressure for a lot of people. And you know, I, I as much as it frustrates me to have a political conversation with Cubans. It's hard not to have empathy, even though they have odious, what I would consider odious opinions about things, because uh, a lot of their family was tortured, right? Mm-hmm. And it takes a lot of effort to also acknowledge the complicity. Like you know, <laughs> like when someone tortures you, it's really hard to be like, you know what? There was nuance. <laughs> Yeah. And and I think <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's um it's also like the reality because something I think about a lot is like all of these systems are then just outdated because for so many people they do want to assimilate because that for them is a viable option as a way of like okay I'm not going to be tortured anymore if I'm not in poverty anymore but like that also feeds into the like larger systems like yeah, they want you to think you're going to be a millionaire. Like they want people to like, cause that gives them a working class. Um, but what I'm more interested in is like helping people be able to identify for themselves the ways in which like these systems are outdated and that being the reason why, or that being a viable option for them to think about how, like, that's why I'm like experiencing what I experience, or that's why like, things don't work out for me or whatever. Like it's not, and that that is the like resolution to it as well, is that like these systems are dated and like we need something that is actually built for like a 21st century and late stage capitalist um, society. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, today actually, as we're recording is the day that uh, um, Amazon is going to be, 
uh, doing their unis uh, or the the people in I think I forget what city it is. I think it's in Alabama that there's a unis- unionization drive that I'm very hopeful for. But yeah, I think that those are the kind of things that like um, I think. I, you know, we did the whole Obama presidency. I don't, I don't know if you remember how clearly, or, or actually, you know what? I'm gonna uh, cut my uh, cut my own opinion and ask you, because you're a millennial, and I am. I want your take on identity because I know, or you're not, you're a Zoomer. <laughs> you're Generation Z, but I like Zoomer because we need something to counteract the Boomer. But, um, so you're a Zoomer. I want to know what's your take on cancel culture and all that. And I know that's like a really fucking hacky term at this point and wokeness and all that shit. But you guys get a lot of the blame for that. And I don't necessarily, and I know at universities that's the case. And I know that sometimes people go overboard in terms of like, uh, you know, people like Barry Weiss. But I think that's all in like real, um trajectory academia right like people that have the opportunity to go to Yale or to go to these like you know they're going to prep schools from when they're kids and and I think that like there's this like um it's weaponization essentially of that and Mm -hmm. and and do you feel like that's happening because I definitely think there's always a good dialogue that 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 is going on between people but it gets hijacked so what do you what do you think about that I think like um, I think that like cancel culture, or like the origins of it, were rooted in what they want, what people want to see as like deplatforming someone who has done things that are wrong. And I, for me, I associate a lot with the Me Too movement because mm-hmm. for me, Me Too was when I'm like in high school, and, and so was the Black Lives Matter movement. So I think holy shit, how young? What? How old are you? I'm, I'm, my 23rd birthday is in two weeks. <laughs> I'm very okay, so, No, no, no. All right. I, I just have, I'm an old person. So, uh, every year feels like it's going by really fast. <laughs> 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 so it's plausible that you were 23 and you were in high school. Not that long ago, but yeah. for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> like, so I think that cancel culture comes from, that essentially like wanting people who have committed sexual assault to like not have a platform anymore and like people who are racist to not have a platform anymore i think though it does get weaponized especially in like the last year where you see people wanting to talk about race more which um i have a lot of thoughts about in general because i spent i and a very solid group of like because in Chicago was when I was finally able to meet other like queer people of color and young queer people of color. So I had like very solid like support system when I was there, all of us and people should get ready for Gen Z because like the consensus is that, and I know not every person in Gen Z is progressive, but there's a large just consensus of like progressivism. Um, what well, define that though? What, what does progressive yeah. mean to Gen Z? Because Cause that's a fucking nebulous thing that no one really knows what it means anymore. It's just yeah. fucking garbage, especially with people like AOC and Ilhan Omar and all these people like wearing that mantle. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll tell you a story, or actually, so I don't, so that I don't forget, the original progressives believed in eugenics. Mm-hmm. Okay, so like progressivism comes from this like sort of like oh science and enlightenment. <laughs> and they believed in eugenics and then that shit went over to like Nazis and it came back. So that term has always been fucking crazy to me that people use. But anyway, what does <laughs> progressive mean now? Cause I, I, I assume you're not pro eugenics and I'm not putting yeah. that on you. <laughs> I think that, um, on zoomers. <laughs> we have a whole generation of people that you believe. <laughs> are you <gonna> <laughs> um, I think in the context of Gen Z, it's maybe a more like soft core progressivism because I think Gen Z and it's just true of white people in the moment we're in now, like, and not just white people, just like a lot of people that are like non-black, et cetera. Like we have a lot of like learning to do, but it does feel like Gen Z is like 
the first generation that is open to a lot more things that any generation in the past has had. Because if you think about it, um, and I know that like you can look up like New York Times articles or whatever about like the median wealth of like a Gen Z person and how just over time, like younger people just get less and less money. That's going to lead to people wanting like agency for working class people or just like people with less money in general. Um, so you would, you, would you say there's more class awareness then? I, I mean, it, it, that's hard to say because like, yes, but then you also still have like extremely rich kids that, and, and that what you're talking about, um, Ivy league kids, like kids who are able to use the, um, historically racist and historically classist institutions that they're for. Cause like, I still know like people I went to high school with like that. Cause there, you still have like liberalism in gen z as well it's really hard to say because oh my god no we gotta end the interview right here (laughs) no no i'm so (laughs) depressed (laughs) i think go um, on but part of that too is um because yeah first i want to talk like there's um a wealth gap in gen z or like a an age wealth gap um and then you also have like our parents were growing up in the, our parents are growing up after the civil rights movement. So it's the first time like people are being taught, Hey, let's maybe treat people equal equally, you know? And I'm not Mm. saying it was perfect after the civil rights movement because it's not, but it's the first time in U S history where it's at least a little more normalized to like not treat black people like shit. And I, and I know. I'm sorry. There's a trial going on that would... Dis- no, exactly. exactly. <laughs> no, but I get what you're saying. There, the, I mean, the things that you guys are experiencing is fucking insane. I still... I'm still not sure that, that uh, Chauvin is going to be... Derek yeah. Chauvin is, yeah. uh, is going to be going to jail. And that I, is really yeah. fucking upsetting. Um, that's, a, that's another interesting aspect of Gen Z, though, is that we're also at a point in late-stage capitalism where, like, the failures of, of capitalism are radicalizing people like period, you know, like people are, are more mad about things because capitalism just continually does not work for everyone. And over time, when you have like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, all the billionaires that are like hoarding the wealth, that's less people that have access to wealth. So that immediately will radicalize people. Yeah. No, I mean, poverty radicalizes people. We've seen that from like uh, the middle East right? (laughs) It's not, they're not bad people. Uh, they're, they're just human beings. They're the oldest society. And now we're showing up with this like idea of democracy. You know, um, the notion of representational democracy is like, (sighs) people keep talking about it like it exists, right? But when at what point has there been representation of people of of like the people right not uh because there's always little things that you can do right you can uh make someone uh three fifths of the person right is that what it was it was three fifths mm-hmm. and uh and things like that and, and and so um it's really fascinating because now we have this like thing where you have that that's why I think progressive is like a word that is really off-putting for me. I'm a fucking leftist, and and um, and the reason that I know that is because I believe in like collective bargaining and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I grew I, look when you were. Th- this is I, I. I'm not like a fucking hero, okay. When you were talking about your field trips, I was like, oh my god. I used to, I lived in Italy. I used to go on fucking field trips all the time on a big bus. I would have romantic rendezvous, you know, like moment. I mean, it's not like I was a kid. It's not like we were making out or, or no, we were, but it was like, I, it was like super fun to go on these things and super cultural. And I got to learn a lot about history, but, um, you know, going to the, the, to, to the idea of like generational wealth, like, that's that wasn't sustainable for me. <laughs> it, yeah. Just because my dad worked for the UN doesn't mean that I was like all good. I had yeah. access to education and stuff like that, and and all of all of it. But you know, like 
as a uh, as a Gen Xer, there was this notion that you could shoot for like, hey man, I just want to be happy, and like, that was a fucking mistake. And my parents were like, hey man, just just, and then to see what happened this year after what happened in two thousand eight. With like these, like every time there's this opportunistic thing where, so like, I guess what I'm at, what I'm thinking about is there's class solidarity at the top Mm -hmm. and until there comes class solidarity at the bottom. So like, are you saying that, uh, yeah, zoomers are going to be like, cause you did mention that there are zoomers that are liberals, but then there's also like, is there uh, generationally poor class of people that, to use your term, that are, um, that are becoming aware of this, like of, of class solidarity, because it seems like what the liberals really want to do is to continue to focus on race and then tout themselves for the fact that they've allowed minorities access. And as a Cuban, we've been at this shit for a long time. We've had Marco Rubio's for a very, very fucking long time. We've had Cuban politicians that I hate, <laughs> right? And that sell people out and that don't give a fuck about things. So is, that the, is, is there that awareness? Because, man, when you said liberals, I just fucking lost it. Like, <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, and I do, I do want to, like, distinguish that I still, um, just from, like, my exposure to the people around me, because that's something about being in rural America, too, is, like, I know a lot about conservatism and I know a lot about liberalism and I know about centrism. Like I know so many things that like I could have spent way like like most of my high school years were just spent like learning about the habits of people like that. But um, I think there's a difference in Gen Z liberalism than, or like it's different than like I, what I see or experience about like millennial liberalism in the sense. And we especially saw it in the past year of like, even people that are liberal still being open to hearing what the needs are then of communities of color. And what? In ways, That's inconceivable. <laughs> in, in ways that, yeah, in ways that I have not seen in the past, you know, like, yeah. um, cause and thinking especially of like June of last year, like, and I know that the black squares like still exist cause that's still a problem as well. But I did also see like, that was the first time you see people like actively sharing like um like bail fund like resources and like things like that like things that like i think that there's a way where liberals at least of our generation like don't even really know that they're being actually like um like leftist or like just or just being socialist in general because and i think that that's a problem where like they don't understand what the word socialism means, but then they are socialists, you know, like they advocate, oh, okay. for, they advocate for things that are just like, like when you say it out loud, it's like, oh, so you like socialism. Like, I think there's still, the Red Scare did a number on the United States and like, we still have to deal with that. But like, the people don't, people um, are informed by their experiences and Americanism and the problems of Americanism. And um, that just shows through, I guess. I love Americanism. I, I I don't think I've heard that. That <laughs> yeah, let's um. You're, you're coining can... some shit. Americanism. I'm gonna Google it because I I I haven't heard it. Is that a term? I I I use it for my work and stuff. I think I Americanism. use Americanism to describe like the specifically United States like consumer culture and um just behaviors that are specifically or that are specific to the sheltered experience of growing up in the indoctrinated like United States. Okay. Uh, Americanism, a word expression or other feature that is characteristic of American English. So, and then attachment or allegiance to the traditions, institutions of idealists uh, and, and ideals of the United States. So yeah. I think, I, uh, so, but I like, I feel like uh, yours wasn't that simple. You know, yeah, like, yeah. I think the way you said it included the imperialism yeah, <laughs> and the I, slavery. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I'm very much like um, 
critiquing Americanism. And yeah. I want to, um, can I screen share too? I want to show. So yeah, go for it. Because I don't show, oh, can you enable screen sharing? Sorry. Oh, yeah. I for, oh, you know what? Fuck. Uh, let's, yeah, I think so. Okay. See, that's what, what's nice about having a, a Zoomer on the show is that, um, that you totally know that, like, I had someone a little bit older than you and she didn't know how to, that, that I could enable the screen. She was like. <laughs> I've been on Zoom school for so long. It's just. <laughs> yeah. I am. Uh, I, I was doing interviews on Skype. <laughs> I don't All even right. use Skype. Um, yeah, we don't have to look at all of these, but because I also I don't show all of my work on um, Instagram. I I'm contemplating like how to show my work because part of the time, like I just feel like Instagram just isn't big enough. Like you can't really engage. No, it dilutes everything. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. You, and you can't really engage with what I'm like trying to show you through Instagram. Cause there's details that I already, cause I have a big screen TV that I'm looking at this on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not yeah. looking at this on a phone so I can see what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Cause you're pretty far away, but there are details. And so that as, as an old man who studied uh, film photography, I know that there's <laughs> some shit yeah. lost in translation, even in this experience. Yeah. So wh uh, um, what format is this? This is not, uh, is this 35? Yeah, all of my work in the last year has been on 35 millimeter. I'm interested in large format. Um, I think, and I think I would, it would benefit what you're trying, what, what you're working on. Yeah. Not I, as a critique, but as, as, a, as someone who <laughs> loves big picture. Yeah, I, um, when I was in, I finished, my, I actually graduated last spring. So we were like the first class to like lose a graduation. <laughs> um, I was doing, I took analog studio classes while I was writing my thesis about Medina because Medina was using large format. Um, so in the semester that like COVID happened, I was halfway through learning large format. And when you learn film, like they teach it to you in black and white first. So I made it to the, like, I did large format in black and white, but um, COVID happened right when I was supposed to start color. So I have some mm -hmm. color large format, but large format is also really expensive. So I'm trying to just like navigate, yeah. like how to use film and like um, how to achieve what I want with, with still being like financially practical. And I also don't, um, I don't really have the opportunity to like commit a, like a formal studio practice approach to my work so um it's I really totally well I used to be a photographer I don't shoot film anymore <laughs> I have a I have a fucking shitload of film rolls that are, are all fucked up I haven't thrown them away but they are so old they're from par probably 2003 and they've all expired and I still can't let them go but yes developing film has only gotten more expensive yeah. Even just shooting 35 millimeter is expensive as fuck. So yeah. I, uh, I also encourage your uh, adaptation because your mind is going to uh, figure ways around this and mm -hmm. you're going to probably be resourceful about shit. Yeah. Because um, even if I were to switch to digital, I would like have to use a mirrorless camera. Like I'm really conscious of like the look I want and I've spent a lot of time even like experimenting with different films and different cameras to like make sure wait what I'm, I'm not that well versed what's the difference what's the difference a mirrorless digital mirrorless, oh. so a mirrorless camera um like digital cameras have a mirror in them so when you take a photo the mirror like hits down to a light sensor um so you're automatically like the sensor is exposed to then a flat image but they do that or that <sighs> is so that you can protect the light sensors because they're very sensitive um a mirrorless camera you just expose the sensors to um the like to what you're taking a photograph of so but then you have a like very different look and it, it does look like more realistic like it gives you a film look essentially and you can like change the exposure whatever you just need to like know how it works because you can ruin those like light sensors very easily okay well, this is how dumb I am, or old, 
I didn't mean dumb. I meant old. Uh, <laughs> I, when I thought it had a mirrorless, I thought like something went down. Because <laughs> didn't the old film cameras have like I a little... Uh, <laughs> yeah, they it Just like moved out of the way. So I was like, oh, it's mechanical mirrorless. <laughs> Not like we have to protect the sensor at all costs and that's why we're putting some mirrors here and all of that mm -hmm. shit. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I also, yeah, I do want to talk about, um, color because color is really important to what I do. Mm. Um, and I think like that could well, especially because there's a lot of faded colors. I forgot that we're, we've been like flipping through these pictures. Can you go back so that I can describe, uh, the ones that you've shown already? Oh yeah. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so, because okay, it's it is audio. I got I got to stop being lazy. So we're looking, and th the reason that I said that, uh, like, there's so much detail. I used to love taking pictures of grass and the different ways that light hits grass mm -hmm. and all of that. And so the reason, like, I also never went for uh, large format because the Fuji six by nine that our school had had been checked out, and I think someone <laughs> stole it eventually. So I couldn't get that, but yeah. So when I'm looking at this image, I'm I'm seeing a lot of little details that are, um, you know, like you have tilled land or like not. It's not grass, but there's there's grassy, dried out grass, uh, hay type elements. You know, this very brown image, and then you have this really blue sky, and then you have t like t there's just a lot of texture on it. So show me the next one. And then it's like, it's, what is this? Is this a, f a farm so, and power um, lines? I, I think it will be better explained if I, um, what was the next one I show? I kind of just cycle through them. I don't even. Oh, it's all good. Uh, just yeah. show us another one and then I'll describe that one. Because we were talking oh, over it. This one, yep, yep. Okay. And then we got a discount liquor store. And this one was the one, so you have, you have this really bright red roof, but then mm -hmm. you're also, you got a lot of uh, signs for alcohol and old English, which I relate to because I was a kid once. Mm -hmm. There's uh, mag, is that Magnum, the ice cream? Bush beer, uh, the, all the way at the bottom of the stairs? Or is it Magnum condoms? I didn't yeah, want to go to condoms. Yeah. Oh, Magnum malt liquor. Oh shit, forty ounce bottles. So this is all all liquor because it's it is a liquor store. Uh, <laughs> they don't advertise ice cream. Uh, and then D CB discount liquor. There's a big American flag, and that's the brightest color. There is a. I see what you're saying about color. There's like fading, and then there's brightness. There's the stuff that's recently repainted, um, which I. You know, and there's rust color and whatnot from uh, great like fencing and grates and stuff. And the age of brick is always really interesting yeah. to see on film. Yeah, um, it's like and and what's interesting is that 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 building doesn't look that old, mm -hmm. but you can tell like it's almost like a um, roughshod sort of mm -hmm. uh, way of um, like repairing something, right? Yeah. Whereas like. Whereas over here in L.A., sometimes that happens, but to the degree that this abandoned sort of, or not abandoned, but like middle of fucking nowhere, uh, very few resources, no, um, no uh, homeowner societies kind of putting pressure on you and shit like that to keep things like pristine. Mm -hmm. Like it's interesting, like what gets updated and what doesn't. And then you also can tell that you're not in California because it's fucking green as shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this one is some silos on the side of a road um, with other farm equipment in the foreground um, and little clouds. <laughs> that yeah, match the but there's subtly, so there's, the, the, it's, uh, it, this image wouldn't work if it was black and white. Yeah, yeah, and... Because um, it's yeah, not I'll, about tonalities, it's about, and, sh and, uh, uh, you know, the zone system, it's about yeah. like actual subtleties in light, light colors. Yeah. And also for me, like representing what I actually saw, because I'm still drawn to color in, and I'm drawn to like color schemes and think about color theory. Um, this I miss the dark room. I miss the color dark room where you're just sitting there and you're, I used to put my headphones on uh, just so that I could like dive into it and like look at the images but uh and but I love that like 
that's one of the things that digital lost for me. Like color correcting on on computers is nowhere near as satisfying. Mm-hmm. I haven't been able to. This my school didn't have a color darkroom, but I've recently learned about like color darkroom printing. I really want to like see if I can uh, do it. It was RC paper, and then we would just put them on this big. Uh, it was a bulletin board or a cork board. It was huge, and then we had these. Um, white balance lights shooting on it it was amazing i would just that was like what if photography was still film and affordable and you know the uh the amateur market was still funding the Mm -hmm. creative market the way that it is in digital (laughs) now i would still be shooting it's Mm -hmm. actually kind of uh melancholy that i'm feeling right now looking at your pictures in color and thinking about this stuff but (laughs) yeah yeah. So now we have like a, go ahead, you would describe it. This is a building I saw um, on the side of the road. Um, but also, yeah, I'll describe it visually first. It's, it's a, it's, um, this is a half torn off bait and tackle, like hand painted storefront sign. Um, okay. And there's a big so, chunk, like a shark took a bite out of it. But yeah, like there's, a, there's a chunk off of the R, like the only half panel still existing. And then you have... Um, and then a, the paint, I, I, I love the sign. So the paint on the sign yeah. is, uh, the, is fading, right? Yeah. Like you're, you're, you're losing some of the uh, detail or like, and then the wood grain is kind of coming through, right? Like it's, yeah. it's a, the paint is eroded off. But then the shape of the board is still expressing itself. And the same thing kind of happens to a lesser degree on the uh, building, but not quite. Like, you're not seeing the actual wood colors. Go ahead. Describe the building. The building, um, it's like a weird, like, triangle-type shape, but goes out into a rectangle. Um, the Whoever painted it um, did kind of, I don't know how else to describe it, but a zebra design. And so it's that's, like, I'm glad you said that because that's yeah, awesome. It's, it's black, um, like abstract, like almost diamond shaped lines on a white backdrop. But then the building has um, a red line on the left side so that severs the white part from a yellow, a half yellow and a half green part. And then in the front you have, um, this is, um, like an air conditioner and then also a septic tank right in front because septic that's a septic tank. tank? Yeah. I was going to, if I, every action movie I've seen has made me think that I should shoot that with a gun and it would explode. So yeah, these are, these are actually <laughs> that's my good. description of that for people. <laughs> septic tanks. I don't remember if, if these are for, um, I, I'm, if I'm remembering them correctly, it means that you're so far away from like a uh, mainstream, like plumbing, that like you need to get your water through like these yeah and i and i imagine is it is it attached to a cesspool i is it part of it i've I've seen a lot of them in my lifetime but i don't know (laughs) okay i i didn't know if you were a rural engineer or not so i wanted to test you (laughs) (laughs) i i definitely could be if i like looked into everything that i saw um but so yeah i a good way that's it's really funny that you um that we have to explain them visually because um, when I was in Chicago, I feel like my, my photographic work kind of started out of like trying to explain to people like where I'm from and them just like not getting it because they've only ever lived in Chicago because I also attended um, the only public school, uh, the only public university in Chicago. So like Mm. you have a lot of students going there that like, that's the only like four year option that's available to them because all the other schools are private. Um, But so I would meet people that have lived in Chicago more or less their entire life. And I'm trying to explain to them like where I'm from and they're like, Oh, so it's like a suburb. And I'm like, it's really, (laughs) especially thinking about like what the Chicago perspective of a suburb is because all the suburbs of Chicago are still connected to Chicago. So I'm like, no, it's like, really it's like out in the middle of nowhere which is why I make some images um that are like this one because it this is all um farmland and we just have like miles and miles and miles of farmland at time like Mm -hmm. it's um and that's how you get between places so you have to drive through farmland um and when I was um when I was thinking about this too like 
when I was a kid, I was very observant of land and like where we were going and like the places that I was at. Um, because we had to spend a lot of time in the car, just like, and I would just look outside, you know, like that's just something I was interested in, like visually. Um, but we are driving between like farmland to get to places. And for me specifically, um, because that's not true of everyone as well. Um, mm. Where I'm from, Saginaw is, um, it's in what's like the Tri-City area of Michigan. So it's right next to Bay City, Michigan, and it's next to Midland, Michigan. Midland, Michigan is where Dow's world headquarters are because Dow was founded there in the 1800s. Um, but the wealth never trickled down, which is why these photos are also really is, interesting. Is Midland is Midland related to um, is like is it Flintish? No, Midland is the the exact opposite of Flint. Okay, so it's like thriving. Time. It's like what? Is is it thriving or? Yeah, it's 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 interesting because it's like thriving for a Midwest like just rural city because they have like a minor league baseball team. Like they have Ooh. really nice schools. Um, we always like hated having to play because their high schools are funded by Dow. So um, their schools are actually called like Dow High School and stuff. Um, but they have like amazing resources. They have like a tennis center there. Like I would go play tennis over there because it's like way nicer. Like we barely have any tennis courts here. Um, it's like- Is there, the are there a lot of like- Go ahead. Is it, it so? I'm imagining Dow Chemical, <laughs> the community that they created, to have a lot of flipper babies. <laughs> or do you know what flipper babies are? No. <laughs> there was a birth control in the '60s. <laughs> I can't even believe it. this is like such fun generational. Like, hey, in the old old times, they made uh, a um, birth control pill that. When women ha eventually started having kids, they had kids that had flippers, like almost like uh, at, at like fish type, mm -hmm. and they're called flipper babies. I mean, yeah. nowadays they probably wouldn't be called that because it would be very problematic. But we're talking like way, way, way back. So um, yeah, I my like a lot of my friends. Let me I Google have... that before I put it out on the air. <laughs> My friends and I do have a theory that like Midland is just polluted and like it's just people either like don't know or like they know and they just accept it um, because Midland is still visually not that different than the photos I'm showing you. It just like has more money. So like mm -hmm. maybe it's just like a bigger house and a nicer house, whatever. But like the yeah. landscape is still the same. And to that, I also want to say like Midland still has... um like head, like not only like just like um if you're thinking of like corporate headquarters but like there are still chemicals there too um last may i don't know if you heard of the sanford dam collapse that happened in michigan um there was like some dam here that was privately owned and was holding like an entire man-made lake and it just collapsed because it like kept getting like terrible grades on like whatever the infrastructure grading is and like no one ever fixed it. But that flooded, that actually flooded Midland, Michigan. Like people had to like evacuate and stuff. Like it was really scary. And now because I live right on the river, like Bay City and Saginaw is both on the, the Saginaw River, which goes like Michigan shaped like this. <laughs> this is where we are. We're you like Michigan right motherfuckers with your hand map. It, God it, damn it. Hey, Florida shaped like this. <laughs> I literally, one of my um, my cousins for like my quinceanera present, like they let me go live with them in California. I'm like, how, like we need to transfer like the hand map thing to like every state because it's just so much easier. Like Illinois, is, like, <laughs> California, is, uh, LA is around here or, or here. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I just um, held up my fist and pointed at my uh, elbow. <laughs> But, uh, or at, lo not my elbow, but like uh, somewhere down there. Um, and I just want to confirm, yes, flipper babies did happen. That was not a dream I had. <laughs> the, the drug is called the thalim, thal diomide tragedy. Thaldiomide? Anyway, lessons from drug safety and regulation. <laughs> um, anyway, we should definitely start to wrap up 
because we have I have uh, been going on we have been going on for an hour and a half, and I definitely want to make sure people listen to all of it. <laughs> um, but uh, I definitely want to have you back on at some point. Um, do you have any image? Oh, okay. So go um, ahead. Go. Let me see. How do I want to rock? Because um, yeah, I was just before we talked about flipper babies again. Um, the Sanford Dam collapsed and flooded like all of Michigan or all of um, Midland, Michigan. Um, but it was said that like some of the dam commingled with like pools at Dow and stuff. But my friends oh. have a theory that like Dow has so much money, like, and it's not like anyone's doing like investigative journalism in Michigan, like that was ever going to like uncover it or whatever. And even if they it's did. It's not like, like anyone's doing investigative journalism that isn't getting arrested and uh, tried for it. So yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, but yeah, all that to say like where, and that also is. Um, and this is a very nice image to you. end on for sure. I am um, like, I'm thinking about how infrastructure wise, like Michigan is all the same because we do, um, when I tell people how close I am to Flint, they're like, oh, I hope it's not like the same water or whatever. But like, it's less about like the water access I have versus like Michigan being a geography subject to essentially what you have is like the car industry being here for like a really hot minute and then like leaving, like after NAFTA, especially like, that's why a lot of people here like hate hated hillary because of like nafta and like people are really mad that like their jobs are gone but like that just impacts politics here so much and like but so but many people but that's so many fair people though. Have, um, conflicting yeah people have conflicting opinions about just like, like so many but things that like conflicting opinions about what still boils down to like capitalism is not a um, sustainable thing, you know, like people having this expectation that like, oh, we had money and it's going to stay here forever. Like all of what's around me and what I'm photographing is the refuse of capitalism that again, I'm subject to. And because I don't have wealth, like I just have to deal with it. And mm. like, that's what I'm trying to show people. No, I get that. That And that definitely shows that's really, so I, you know, you, you hit on something that was really interesting to me, which is the idea of, um, of, because essentially, you know, I mean, she did like, you know, you were talking about how Pennsylvania was also related a little bit to the Midwest. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because I have my issues with Hillary Clinton. She hasn't affected me directly in the same way that these people have been affected, but I live in California where the idea that to, to question Hillary Clinton is like sacrilege, but at some point there needs to be some accounting for these things, these decisions that have been made. And going back to the weaponization thing that you were talking about, um, when Hillary Clinton was running, she, you couldn't, call her out for any of the things that Bill Clinton did. But, uh, you know, they know the same people. <laughs> you know, like, if, if, if let's say that you and I were a couple and I was a president. You would be coming to the dinners, right? Mm. So, to me, the idea, like, that the Midwest, that's not the most upsetting thing for me about like you know and i am not even that angry at them for voting for trump you know i i understand your experience being embedded in that is probably very different and it's valid if you are very frustrated with that and i think that that's kind of the thing that i was talking about when i was talking about people from like a mission michigan white guys from the west uh, like that come west they um they sort of are like no, you don't know. And I think that that diaspora might be kind of where, like, I think generally, like, it, when we were talking about the 90s, a lot of media has just shit on the Midwest, flyover country, 
all of that. It's like, uh, it's this notion that California is this place where everything that's progressive is happening and we're the enlightened people and we know fucking everything. But to me, the idea that people are upset at Hillary Clinton and Trump, it, it, uh, you know, that people support Trump in Michigan makes 100% sense to me because the way that I always try to think about the immigration debate, right? Like, there's this... Um, this is again going back into the wokeism thing. There's there's this break between people who um, are pro immigration, but then are pro war, right? Like you have Democrats that are war hawks now and will destabilize a country and want to keep want to turn Honduras into an open air prison, right? And they're the ones that are talking about all this woke shit. They're the ones that are like. You know, we still have to coup these people because they have all these resources that need to go to the global financial market, right? That's why, it, like, uh, uh, the Bolivian coup is uh, legitimate or it's not, a, it, it, yeah, where they, they, they question Evo Morales, they got him out of fucking uh, power, and then they had an election and Evo Morales' successor won the election, and then, like, it's all this fucking meddling and so the debate of like, like you have these people that are liberals that say things like, oh my God, you know, like we really need to be nice to people and all these immigrants and we have to be like, but at the same time, they're the ones that are being the harshest outside of our borders. They're the ones that are dehumanizing people. They're the ones that um, have done like horrible horrible fucking shit recently. I mean, I know that you, the, the GOP gets a lot of credit for the shit that was going on in the 80s, but we're talking about the last fucking decades, right? And from 2000, when, when did, uh, it was what, um, 2008 to 2000, what, uh, 2000, when, when did Trump get in power? 16? So, yeah. so, so 2016, we had a, a, a black man in office and he was called the deporter in chief, right? But then you have on the other side these Republicans, and they look at this issue of immigration, and they're like, "Oh, they're taking our jobs! They're taking our jobs!" Both motherfuckers are taking your jobs, and that's what we see now, right? It's a division of labor. It's like, hey, you appeal to these motherfuckers, you appeal to these motherfuckers. Oh my God, Trump supporters are racist because they don't want to lose their jobs. Like, yeah, they don't understand the fucking subtleties and all of the complications, but they definitely know that NAFTA was a fucking problem. NAFTA was a GOP thing. Bush couldn't pass it. The first Bush couldn't pass it. Then you get, uh, what's his name? Bill Clinton. He's like, hey, what's up, everybody? I'm a Republican. <laughs> the economy booms because that shit is all short term. We get Glass Steagall. We, you know, like both party serves parties serve the same masters. So on that class struggle thing, I feel like I have a lot more in common with Trump supporters than I do with people like you know, like why? I don't know if you know who Bill Crystal is. I'm not even gonna explain him. But he's, he's, he's a, a dude that was really active. Uh, John Stewart used to make sh the fun of him. And he used to get his ass kicked all the time. John Stewart on The Daily Show used to have him on during the Bush years and kick his ass because all of his opinions were shit. He becomes anti-Trump and now he's a fucking hero. And then what did he say recently? He said uh, that we should, we should include uh, uh, Puerto Rico and we should include other places like Cuba. And it's like, we, Cuba's not an American territory. So all of these motherfuckers have the same mindset and they divide the labor of fucking people. And so in terms of class solidarity, if we can't, I feel like if we can't work with Trump supporters, like, yeah, they're racist, but they also are anti-war. How racist can they be? I, you, I would, um, I'm... You're a Zoomer. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, and I, I, th I was, I kind of gauged this going in. I don't know if we're going to agree, but, um, no, we can't, we can disagree. Yeah. I, I, but I really want to like pose this to you as just like a perspective. Cause I've obviously had to think about this like my entire life. Like 
there are Trump supporters like in my family, and everyone can say that, you know. There are um, Trump supporters in in Cuba, in, in exactly, Miami, yeah, Cuba, exactly. Miami. Exactly. Um, but something I think about, um, and my friend recently told me about like, what is it called, like generative or general? People that believe, people that are like leftists, but they voted for Trump because they were like, you know, like capitalism just got to like kill itself for us to get to like the next. Oh, thing. no, no. I'm not pro accelerationism. That's what it is. Anyway, yeah. go ahead. So, yeah. I'm, and I'm not saying you are. I say uh, this is how I like kind of frame it. I think of like my politics as um, what is what is needed like urgently that I have control over. So I don't like condone either party but i think we need to think more critically about um the threat honestly the threat that is posed by trump supporters even when they are working class because that's something i've really struggled with because it's still appealing to this like unity of like let's get the trump like we need the trump supporters on our side but the reality is like trump supporters have never called for unity when it's about me and trump supporters also actively contribute to things that are harming my life because especially in the past year i've been thinking more about like um how even republican politics is actively harming um people that are rural people of color and like you can always um if like even if i'm not a good example or like my experience is a good example like the conservatives that are in michigan are also responsible for what's happening in flint because michigan still even if you were to think not about just the governor like we have so many like Republican seats that that all takes up space and time. And I'm not saying that like, no, 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 I don't just, I, 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 this is not invalid. I, I totally understand that. Go ahead. Finish, I finish what like, you're saying. And yeah. And I don't think that putting a liberal in place of that is going to be any help either because it's not because Gretchen still hasn't done anything about Flint. Not that I think like, and obviously she's had a lot of her freaking plagues. I don't think anyone would run for governor of Michigan and like, assume that what happened this year was going to happen um but regardless yeah she still hasn't done anything for flint um when we continue to like excuse the agency that um trump supporters actually do have because that's where my that's what i'm saying too with my work about land-based politics is like they all contribute to decisions that still impact me negatively that they will never see the repercussions of and i totally 100 percent think that what you're saying is valid. I'm not even, the next thing that I'm going to say is not arguing with that. It's adding to it, okay? And adding distinction to it. So, I don't think every Trump supporter is the same. I think that there are people that were so angry at people that have told them that they're on their side for so long you got to understand that we're dealing with a generation of people that were a power center in my lifetime, right? Like, when we're talking about hollowing out the middle class, it's atrocious. But then, I am living in California. We just kicked a whole bunch of people out of Echo Park Lake. People settled in Echo Park Lake. It's a, it's a gentrified neighborhood here because they were, set, they were told to go there. And then they put a fence around the lake. Right? And so this is in support of your, what, what you're saying about Trump supporters, okay? They put a fence around the lake and they... Like, it, uh, I've seen a video of it uh, on Ana Iwataki, who was on the show before we did uh, YouTube. She was on the show, and she is part of this uh, J-Town solidarity thing that is anti-gentrification. I'm very much interested in that. Because over here, yeah, Trump supporters are, are definitely a problem in California. So, like, that is the, the... But when you get the Trump supporters that you're dealing with here they are wealthier. Yeah. We're not dealing with class. And so my contention, like my, my, my clarification is you're right. If we put liberals in there, it's not going to make a difference. 
they're going to vote the same way because the, the, they serve the same masters. One is going to be more racist and one is going to be pretending to not be racist, right? One is going to be saying like, oh, no, people in, in, in poor countries deserve to have sweatshops, right? <laughs> and so, so what I'm talking about are the, are the people that have been shit on and have been misguided, Right, like they're understanding, they're listening to the same masters that some people that are in the the professional class are listening to on the uh, on the left. Right, I think collective bargaining is the key, and collective bargaining is going to have to happen between people that disagree. And when you look at like when you when you look, let's not like because fascism gets caught up in this idea of it being like super powerful because. You had the Nazis. But when you really look at, like, the, the first fascist was Mussolini. And the reason that he came in power was because the liberals were so feckless. So for me, it's part of an entirely same system, right? There is solidarity between the left and the right. Joe Manchin gives cover for AOC not give, getting us the, the $15 minimum wage, right? Like... Uh, and I, I hope I'm not killing any hope here. <laughs> but AOC is not your friend. AOC has become assimilated. She, she, uh, she told the DSA in an interview recently that uh, it's privileged to criticize Joe Biden. Now, Joe Biden said he didn't want to fucking live in a jungle. So, like, the idea in a racial jungle, right? Like, it, he was pro-crime bill. And so, and, and he also has been accused of a very legitimate rape and all of these things. So for me, the distinction is not, uh, yeah, there are very powerful people that are Trump supporters that are full of shit. But the people that have been shit on and are racist, and I get that that is not okay, but I know people that have been shit on that are racist. Like, uh, racism, if we're, if we're building on the, the, um, the power thing, it is valid to call these people racist, right? Like, uh, if anybody is racist to you as a Trump supporter, they are racist. It's legitimate. But their economic struggle is similar, and we don't talk about economics in this country. And my concern is that there is a fight against white supremacy that is supporting white supremacy in a sense. Because when you look at leaders like Martin Luther King, when you look at leaders like uh, Fred Hampton, who just had that movie, the Judas and the Black Messiah, that I haven't seen, but I'm aware of his, his story. When you look at uh, uh, Mal uh, Malcolm X, you're dealing with people... Well, Malcolm X, not so much. It's separate but equal. But he was talking about economics. He was talking about economic empowerment. And so for me, leftism... You know, like... When you, when you say you're a leftist and you're a liberal and you're like on the left because you're pro-gay, like that shit is new. In 2008, that wasn't a thing. Leftism has not been woke, ever. Leftism is about collective bargaining, bargaining and humanizing people, right? And leftism has been uh, accused of racism be, by be, saying that people are too class-focused, so I want to acknowledge that. But for me, to completely discount a bunch of people because they're reacting emotionally to the, uh, like, if I, okay, if I discount every Trump supporter because they're reacting emotionally to the wrongs that have been done to them by the people that they perceive doing them wrong, uh, uh, if I discount every Trump supporter because they vote against their own interests without actually me sitting down and analyzing, like, the nuance behind the, their thing because I don't think every Trump every leftist that voted for Trump um, wanted the country to fall to shit he was anti-war anti-war is a fucking anti-war is pro-democracy and you can't you can't have a left so like both parties like there is no politician in Europe and this is uh, something that somebody uh, Jimmy Dore said but there is no politician in Europe that is to the uh, to the right of Joe Biden Absolutely not. Boris Johnson is pro healthcare, and he is a war hawk, <laughs> as much as he can be as mayor of London. But like, you 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 cannot redefine these things as left and right. 
You know who was a liberal? Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher, pro-empire, pro, you, you know, like, uh, liberalism is not leftism. Liberalism has historically been a thing that is conservative, and they see the world as this part, as, as resources that go into the global, like, you know, I'm actually, I, I just uh, listened to Caitlin, or I saw something that Caitlin Johnstone posted, and I'm sorry I'm going on for so long, but the... Um, Caitlin Johnson just posted this thing about how, like, we don't make fun of the Western Empire for for criticizing the Uyghur Muslim, like, China for uh, putting Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps. We're literally, like, not good people. And we always t th overthrow other countries because we don't want them to have their resources on this, like, oh, we're so good. And those are the liberals that do that 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 support that, right, since the Iraq war. So for me... The idea that like we can just discount people based on their opinions is is not a dialogue that's going to serve anybody. It's not class solidarity. You have Ellen DeGeneres hanging out with George W. Bush, and 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 you don't have that anywhere else. Anyway, sorry. I think <laughs> um, yeah, to like end on too like. I think we have because I I agree with what you're saying about like. I think we've uh, we're agreeing. I'm just yeah yeah. I, I wanted to add to like, if class solidarity is the goal, we have to be careful, like, because I, I understand what you're saying about like, there are Trump supporters who like were reactionary in being supportive of Trump, because that's the case of like, a lot of the people that are here that I know and like, because, and I understand like, the political agency of the collective Trump supporters in Michigan is not the same as like, the agency of like billionaires and like, Joe Biden and all that kind of stuff. I do think, however, um, and going back to the conversation of Americanism, there are Trump supporters who are Americanists, where when we're saying that we want class solidarity, there are Trump supporters who are like, like, anti like the antithesis of that kind of style. Like they are Trump supporters because they still want, um, they still want things to be American and they want Americanism and they genuinely believe that like, Americanism is the solution. So um, I think like being conscious of that is really important. And that's why like, I just try to like advocate for criticality because I think- And I, and I agree only, with you on that. Not only will you have Trump supporters who will not change and are not interested in like collective, like working class agency. Um, we need people that are interested in that to start like calling those people out because there are Nazis that are like Trump supporters. Like there are like- and they're all out here too. And they're people that like would benefit from leaving capitalism, you know, like, but still believe that capitalism is going to work. So I think like- But that, that then weird. that becomes a discussion about propaganda, right? Exactly, yeah, and, but that's, but, yeah, that's- But, I, but I think, but what my- And like being indoctrinated by like American school systems. And but also American is, world, Americanism- having, Go ahead, sorry, having, finish. Yeah, sorry, like having, um, it's the result of, the indoctrination of like just America as in general, whether it's like through the school system, but just like growing up American and believing that the world is the United States, you know, like people here genuinely believe like they have it bad just because they're white on the receiving end of like poor capitalism. But at the same time, you have Americanism on the left, yeah. on the liberal left. So the problem that we agree is Americanism, where it's like, uh, actually, it's not even Americanism. It's American exceptionalism, which is this idea that as long as everything is good between, between our borders, we are good people, right? And that is the fallacy of the, of the uh, liberal left, of the neoliberal, right? Where it's like, okay, the neoliberal, look, I am all pro-trans rights, but there is something wrong when the people that didn't give us gay marriage on purpose, right? Like that, the, it was, it, it, it was, it, anybody that tells you that the Democrats gave us gay marriage, they were anti-gay marriage until uh, um, David Geffen and a few of his friends, rich motherfuckers, because we live in a capitalist society, started putting money behind a campaign and they failed in 2008 I remember seeing a car with a woman saying no gay no gay rights no gay taxes right and and so there is no solution 
in looking to the higher classes to give us help. We can't look to AOC. We need to start having a conversation with homeless people and talk about economics and not about Trump versus Hillary. I, that's, that's my, that's my uh, contribution to this conversation. Because, I, I, again, I don't think that we uh, disagree. I think that we agree on this. And I think that, like, the idea of uh, not letting people slide is perfectly fine. I have a, no problem with people being held accountable for racist things that they're saying, right? For problematic things that they're saying. I have no problem with making the effort to speak correctly, to respect people's pronouns, and all of that. Like, it is all about talking to people about their humanity. And just because people are not in that place doesn't mean that they're not your, that, that they shouldn't be your ally, right? Like, just because they're hateful doesn't mean that, that they wouldn't benefit from socialism. So how do we talk to them about that without alienating them by telling them that all of their opinions that they've come to are wrong flat out, which is, I think, what cancel culture is about. It's, it's about fascism, right? Like, it's, it's about, like, yo, we can't, like, right now, we cannot question uh, Joe Biden at all. So, anyway, this is a really interesting inter intergenerational thing, and, and, and I really appreciate it, and I, th I don't think we're going to resolve this, and I'd love to have you back, and, and I definitely want, you know, like, this is so much fun. I knew this was going to kind of go uh, over here. I didn't, I thought you were a millennial, I, you know, but... <laughs> But this is great. I, th but but th this is the point. We can't, ha like, these conversations aren't having, ha happening mm -hmm. publicly, right? Like, yeah. we are disagreeing on small things, and it's not derailing the entire thing. You don't yeah. like Trump supporters. I don't either. But I don't think they're the devil, and I don't think you think they're the devil. I think that you think you, you were on the same page about that. But... Um, I think the problem is that the people that are in charge are just not fucking helping anybody, either of us, and they divide us like that. Mm -hmm. You have the last word. Oh my god. It doesn't have to be great. <laughs> no, I, I'm glad that you mentioned like about being on the same page because that's that's what I'm also like implying too, like when I'm saying like um about like trying to find some type of solidarity with Trump supporters, I need them to be on the same page. Like I need, cause that's all I'm asking is like, I'm asking pe that people recognize my humanity and that's part of the photography as well. Because what I'm showing people is a very marginal perspective and marginal scenes and marginal landscapes that like you've never seen before in your whole life, but this is my life. And like, that's the point, you know? No, yeah, and, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that, uh, and I think all of that is valid. I can't account for your experience at all. But I also can't account for anyone's experience. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that is the thing, like, um, just the idea of having empathy for people, even if you don't justify their opinions, right? Like, like if someone is having a tantrum, like, let's say a, a little child is having a tantrum, right? Like, I mean, ugh. Oh. I already hate this analogy because I'm belittling Trump supporters. But let's say a leftist child is having a fucking tantrum, <laughs> right? And and, and, uh, and and like, they're not fucking right. But I've been there, you know. I felt betrayed, and so like, where do we find the empathy where we can start the conversation? Because I feel like a lot of that cancel culture is about like. You know, and I and 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 for me, the hope is that you and the more reasonable liberals of your generation will be able to find that common ground. The ones that aren't necessary, like, but the ones of your class, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and I think it's also like being specific and when we ask, because for like, I still am interested in empathy for the most vulnerable. You know, like, I'm still advocating for Flint. Like, Flint still does not have clean water. Like, that's how you like tantrum should be resolved and that's where it gets really complicated because people are associating their feelings with these experiences of late stage capitalism but we still need to remember that like there are people that do have it worse than us and we need to take care of them as well well but then my my and and i and to extend that i would say like i feel that about syria right now mm -hmm. yeah exactly 
You know, I feel that about Syria, who's being bombed, who before we got our money is being bombed by Biden. So, like, my, my point is, like, the righteousness mm-hmm. is sort of derailing conversation because on both sides, there is this, like, oh, okay, I give a fuck about the most marginalized, but, like, do we? No, I do agree, we? and I think... Do we? Um, like, I mean, like, you know, because you're Chicana, but, like... There's fucked up shit happening in Me- Mexico. How yeah. could we fix that? There's and fucked I, up shit happening, you know, like, we, like, if you're a socialist, like, how do you tell, okay, how do you tell a Trump supporter? How do you explain to a Trump supporter that it's maybe not okay, without making them a racist, it's maybe not okay to overthrow foreign governments so that we take all their shit? And, and then how do you tell them that, like, we didn't need to do that because all we had to do was having manufacturing in this country. And so when we're taking, when we're overthrowing um, Bolivia for their lithium, it's not just for Elon Musk, who made a fucking tasteless joke on Twitter saying, like, well, who, whoever we want as the fucking class uh, 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 pinnacle that he is, right? Like... How do we tell them, like, hey, man, like, you know, how do we break the myth of American exceptionalism without dehumanizing Americans, right? Like, um, because I, I agree with you. And I know, like, for me, my politics is still conscious of colonialism, like, and like I've been saying, too, with just like land ownership, like, that's all embedded deeply in colonialism. I think a way to explain then to people that Americanism doesn't work because that's what a lot of people are hung up on is they're hung up on the thinking that America is the best and that we live in this bubble. Exceptionalism. Yeah. That's why American exceptionalism, we both agree. American exceptionalism is white supremacy. Go on. And, and um, I think my, at least my contribution then to helping people move past that is by showing them that the American dream is not true. You know, like yeah, because for anybody. Yeah. No, and I think that that, and I think that that's, that's good work. I think that's, that's valid. Good that's, work. That's like how I, that's, I think a strategy then we can employ to do that because, um, yeah, an important part of like, I'll, I'm really conscious of like, and want to like talk about through my work, like that we are not far from Flint, you know? And so that helps then people like center themselves and like the scheme of capitalism and colonialism, because they have to reckon with that. They're not these billionaires and they're not the ones making these choices. And it just helps orient them politically in a way then that sets them up to think about these larger systemic issues of white supremacy and colonialism. And, but we, like I said, like we can do that by like basically shattering the American dream. Yeah. I mean, the American dream. That's the first step. And I'm not We haven't shattered it, you know, but I think that, okay, I, I get, okay. The American, the, the American dream has been shattered, and I think that you, what you're saying is that you're trying to communicate to that, that to people that don't understand that yet. And I think that that is a valid pursuit, and I, think, and I, and I commend you for like that. Like, I think that that is healthy, right? Like, and, and, I, and, and, and in this discussion, you've always talked about Trump supporters as, as people, right? And, 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 and I think that that is what separates you from the more problematic leftist, uh, right wing leftist uh, group that I that I that I have issues with, right? So so anyway, this is a really fascinating conversation. I kind of wish that we <laughs> had uh, uh, what's it called H- had more time because I think like, and I'll definitely have you back on. But I, 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 I think what's interesting is that the, we are two leftists, essentially, who believe in collective bargaining, and we are having a conversation about our experiences, right? And my experience is... So I think that my experience is informed by the fact that I'm Cuban because um, my awareness comes from the fact that like I think part of Americanism and part of American socialist movements is not willing to acknowledge like they're so militant about being leftist that they're not willing to acknowledge that it fascism isn't the only form of totalitarianism Mm -hmm. and so 
when you see people on the quote unquote left cancel people, there's an authoritarian there there are they are marginalizing human perspectives. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to end on this, but there is a debate as to whether people like Trump should be censored by very powerful tech billionaires, right? Mm-hmm. And historically, in my experience, whenever people make the argument of it's a private company, now it is missing out on the idea of like the history of how um, private companies are f- used in fascism. Right, like uh, the 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 Nazis, even not just not just the Italian fascists who were the original fascists, but the Nazis, they were very pro private industry because that gave them cover, right? Not to met, but I mean the Nazis also were really good at putting their people in power, which we've seen from Tea Party people. We've seen you know, but for some reason, the people that we want to be in power, like. The people that we want AOC to be, the obstructionists that we want them to be, they never are. And, and that's an interesting thing. And that, to me, is what sort of, like, when people are like, oh, Trump supporters vote against their own interests. I'm like, yeah, we do too. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's, it just boils down to capitalism. Um, I do yeah. want to say, um, I don't, like, identify as a leftist. But I also don't really identify as like anything. <laughs> I okay. Just, I I don't know. I don't. I like haven't really like made a definitive. No, like, I mean, I, this is. It's taken me a long time to get to being a leftist, and and my leftism is different from everybody's leftism, right? And like, yeah, and I think like that's not to say I don't agree with like leftist ideals, because, and I just think it's a matter of like I just don't. I just don't know yet. <laughs> we'll see. No, and that's fair. I mean, you're still young. You're still, like, yeah. learning a, a bunch of stuff. And that's not a, a condescension thing. I've been talking to you as an equal. Like, definitely. Mm-hmm. I think you have the intellectual ability of somebody that that is aware of these things. And to not want to define yourself. I, I, I define myself as a leftist because my objective is to put myself farther left than the mm-hmm. Democrats. And, and 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 the reason that I u- do that is because I think that historically leftism, you know, like fucking yeah. the communists, is, communists weren't pro gay. That's like a, a, a that is a um, a a new development. That's an assimilation, like right, like my I, my my understand my perception of how that gay uh, vote thing happened. Oh, gay gay rights thing like gay rights to marry it to, to marry and uh, and love who you love is um is that like that was like abortion we were gonna fight that shit until we lost and then somehow senile joe biden fucked up and said like yeah the, and then they had to like back it up it was a, like <laughs> you know <laughs> it it was not a a righteous fight that right. people got. But now you have a lot of wealthy, like gay people in a class that have a party. Whereas yeah. like all the people on the lower classes, the Democrats and the Republicans don't have a party that like the whole point of Trump was that he wasn't a, a, a Republican. He was anti-war. You get what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. anyway, uh, I feel like we should definitely wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> We're um, at two hours, but I I was ready for this. <laughs> I, I I know that we we dabble in these things, and I I'm very interested in your your perspectives and 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 like I said, your opinion is equally valid to mine, right? Like it's a, I, I have no no experiences like yours, so um, go ahead. Um yeah, do people do outros or anything? Um, oh, well, I, yeah, definitely. If you have stuff that you want to promote, I just wanted to give you an, a, another shot to say something, but we would have just kept playing ping pong. Oh, yeah. If you would have said something insightful, and then I would have like, oh, my God. But no, uh, anyway, yeah. uh, do you have stuff that you want to promote? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I feel like I have a really hard time getting, like, any kind of support or platform. So uh, I do want to promote um, – my Instagram because I post my work on there or post some of my yeah. work on there. You have um, a YouTube channel too, right? Yeah, I do. I, 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 I'm trying to like, I'm thinking. I mean, so am I. 
yeah, what being an influencer can like mean, you know, like, cause maybe it is like a PhD student, maybe it's like whatever, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm, but yeah, I'm going through graduate school and like, I would love feedback on my work or just the ideas that I've been workshopping. So um, by supporting my Instagram, like liking my pictures really helps me because I need to get in the algorithm more. Um, mm. But also just to be a capitalist, I do sell on Depop. Please buy my vintage clothes. They're really cool. Depop, your stuff is very cool. And it incorporates some of your landscape ideas, right? You yeah, do, yeah, you I, yeah really I do. Cool. I do um, have jacket drops where I put my photographs on vintage jackets. I'm actually dropping one, like, I have a spring collection coming in April, so. Cool. I, 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 uh, let me see if I find something that I like. Because I did like the last drop that you had. And I definitely want to support uh, you because you, you, you do say some interesting things. You, you're out there. I, I would encourage people to follow you. This is, I mean, I kind of knew we were going to talk for two hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the reason that I said like, hey, maybe we should talk about something else is because like I didn't want this to become I felt like it would be a misuse of resources to just talk about visual stuff when I know when the whole show is about ideas and I know <laughs> you've got good ones, you know, Thank so you. so I really support you. And, um, and and I definitely like so what's your Instagram? Uh, my Instagram is um I have the white spelling of the name Kaylee. So it's at X A Y L E I G H at Kaylee, but with an X instead of a K and same for Depop. And same for Depop? Depop? Okay. And YouTube and Depop. is Kale348. I should probably switch Three, everything to that. It's way easier to say. <laughs> you may you may want to. <laughs> but yeah, and then uh, I'll link to your, if I can, I'll link to your YouTube stuff. Like, um, tell me if you have a video that you want me to promote. But anyway, actually, you know what? And then we're at, we'll do the, all of this off air. And um, I am at What's My Thesis on Instagram, where you can see all the show related content. And I am at uh, Javier Proenza on Instagram. We have a YouTube channel. If you want to look at some of this stuff, if you want to subscribe, we may be able to monetize eventually. Uh, I don't want to read commercials, but I will take Google money. <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, we're on every podcasting platform that you could possibly imagine. So follow us on that. Uh, and, yeah, thank you for listening to the show. <laughs>